In this video, we will discuss the applications of Gauss's law. In particular, we will see how to use Gauss's law to calculate electric fields due to systems such as point charge system, an infinite line charge system, planes, and spheres. The idea of using Gauss's law to calculate electric field is pretty simple. So this is the expression for Gauss's law. In order to calculate electric field for a given system, we need to determine that factor, the area factor. And this is governed by the geometry of the system. The net charge on the right-hand side of this equation is usually given, so this information is presented, and since you have determined the area from the geometry and the net charge from the information given, one should be able to determine the electric field of the system from Gauss's law. To begin with, let's look at a point charge. Let's say you have a charge, a negative charge, with a magnitude of 1 coulomb. Now you want to determine the electric field that this charge produces at a distance, let's say, 1 meter from where the charge is. So right there. So in order to determine the electric field from Gauss's law, we first have to construct the so-called Gaussian surface. And for this system of point charge, the Gaussian surface will be in a form of a sphere. So that is the Gaussian surface in this case. Now let's write down the expression for Gauss's law. E dot A equals the net charge enclosed by the Gaussian surface over epsilon naught. Now note the electric field produced by a point charge like that will be heading in that direction as we discussed previously in our previous videos. So it is a radial. The aerial vector for this spherical surface will be going also in a radial direction and the direction of that is outward. So that is the aerial vector. Putting this information together, the left-hand side of this equation will simply become the magnitude of the electric field times the area of that spherical surface. And since this vector and that vector is anti-parallel to each other, the angle between them is 180. Cosine 180 is minus 1. So that's times with minus 1. The net charge enclosed by this Gaussian surface is actually minus 1 coulomb, minus 1, over epsilon naught. So the minus goes away, and you can solve for the electric field. So the electric field is 1 over epsilon naught. The area, the surface area of this spherical surface is 4 pi. The radius is 1 meter, so 1 squared. So the electric field in this case is quite simply 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught newton per coulomb in the direction inward towards that point charge. Now let's look at infinite line charge system. So the line charge is along the y-axis as shown and the charges are distributed uniformly along this line charge indefinitely up and down towards infinity in both ways. Assume that we want to determine the electric field that this infinite line charge system produces at a distance, say, r along the x-axis. For a system like this, the Gaussian surface will take the shape of infinite cylinder passing through the observation point like that. Now keep in mind the cylinder, the Gaussian surface, also extends infinitely in both directions. So the electric field produced by this infinite line charge, the positive charges distributed along the y-axis, will be in a direction perpendicular to the curved surface of this cylinder, like that. So that is the pattern of the electric field produced by this infinite line charge. 
So what is the field strength here? Now note that this is what we called as continuous charge distribution. That means we have to assign a quantity called the linear charge density lambda. Now this linear charge density has a unit of coulomb per meter. It tells you how much coulomb is contained within a certain length of that line charge. So within this length, the amount of charge is that lambda times L. If we take the distribution of charge along this line to be uniform, that means this lambda is a constant. So let's apply Gauss's law to determine the field. So E dot A equals the net charge contained by this Gaussian surface over epsilon naught. Note that the top surface of the cylinder and the bottom surface of the cylinder does not contribute because there is no field in that direction. So the only contribution comes from the curved surface of that cylinder. So along the curved surface everywhere, the electric field is parallel to the area vector. So that will simply becomes Ea. The amount of charge contained by this giant cylinder is quite simply lambda times the entire length of this cylinder, let's call it capital L, over epsilon naught. However, the curved surface of a cylinder is quite simply 2 pi, the radius of the cylinder, which is r, times the length of the cylinder. And that equals lambda L over epsilon naught. L goes away. And the electric field, the magnitude of the electric field, will simply becomes lambda over 2 pi epsilon naught r in the units of newtons per coulomb. And that is the result sought after. Next, let's look at an infinite charge plane system. So this is an infinite charge plane. It extends to infinity in all directions in terms of its length and in terms of of its width, like that. And charges, let's say in this case they're positive charges, are distributed on the surface, on both the surfaces of this infinite charge plane. Say that you run an axis through the center of this plane like that, and you want to determine electric field at some point in one side, here, or let's say here. The answer should be the same due to the symmetry of the system. Of course, we need to construct the Gaussian surface and we can use some sort of a cylinder as the Gaussian surface, like that. The direction of the electric field that this infinite charge plane produces at, say, distance r will be in that direction, penetrating the flat surface of that cylindrical Gaussian surface. So this red cylinder is the Gaussian surface that we have constructed. So the electric field is going like that. Now note that this is the area through which the electric field is penetrating, so we need to determine the electric flux through those areas. The curved surface of the cylinder is immaterial because there is no electric field penetrating those curved surfaces. Note, if you look at this flat surface, let's say with surface area A, the aerial vector is also going in that direction. That flat surface has a surface area of A as well, with the area vector parallel to this electric field. So let's calculate the flux through this entire cylinder. On the left-hand side of that flat surface, this one, E dot A will simply becomes EA. The right surface will have a similar contribution, EA. So when you add the total flux, it's quite simply 2EA equals the amount of charge that is contained within that Gaussian surface is what we need to work out now over epsilon naught. Note this is a surface charge distribution. 
so we should introduce a quantity known as surface charge density. It's analogous to linear charge density that we introduced for a system of infinite line charge before. However, for surface charge density, the unit is coulomb per meter squared. It measures how many coulombs, how much charge is concentrated within certain given area, like A in this case. And let's assume that this infinite charge plane is uniformly charged, so this sigma, the surface charge density, is a constant. So in terms of sigma, the net charge contained within that Gaussian surface is quite simply sigma times A over epsilon naught. A cancels, and the electric field is given by the following expression. You see that the electric field is constant, not only at this distance, but anywhere in a horizontal direction. And of course, this is only true if the charge plane is an infinite charge plane. So if you take this direction to be the x-axis, then the direction of the electric field on this part of the cylinder is parallel to I hat, and the electric field on this side is parallel to minus I hat. So we can write the electric field here as sigma over 2 epsilon naught I hat, and over here is minus sigma over 2 epsilon naught I hat. Now let's look at the following system. It's a uniformly charged sphere. So let's say it is a sphere with radius capital R. And the charge is distributed uniformly within the volume of this sphere, with a total charge being capital Q, positive capital Q. Let's say you want to determine the electric field that this uniformly charged sphere produces at distance outside the sphere and at certain distance within the sphere. Namely, two observation points. One is outside and the other one is inside the sphere. So how do we proceed? Let's determine the electric field when the observation point is outside the sphere. Now the Gaussian surface is of course a concentric sphere like that with radius little r and you apply Gauss's law for that Gaussian surface. So the electric field and the area vector will be parallel to each other because the electric field would be going like that. The aerial vector is also radial like that, so it's E dot A becomes E A. The right hand side of Gauss law is the amount of charge contained within this large Gaussian surface, and that is just the total amount of charge, capital Q over epsilon naught. So the electric field will simply become capital Q over the area of this green Gaussian surface is a 4 pi radius squared epsilon naught. And that is the answer if the observation point is outside the sphere, namely the electric field everywhere there at a distance r from the center. Now what if the observation point is within that sphere? Let's say you are interested in determining electric field at that point. Note that the radius of this sphere is capital R. So the Gaussian surface that we construct now is smaller that encompasses the observation point situated a distance little r from the center. In order to determine the amount of charge contained in that tiny little sphere, we need a quantity called the volume charge density. Volume charge density rho has a unit of coulomb per cubic meter. It tells you how much coulomb is contained within a certain volume. So in this case, the amount of charge, the net charge contained by that Gaussian surface, is quite simply the uniform charge density rho times that volume of that little sphere, which is 4 over 3 pi r cube. Electric field and aerial vector parallel to each other. So Gauss's law gives the following. This is the surface area of the sphere and this is the amount of charge contained. After a few cancellations, like that, you get the following expression for the electric field. Note that it has a linear dependence. 
on the distance from the center. Rho in capital Q is related like that.